I do know a lot of people who struggle with change, and, and I'm uh, personally not one of them. I absolutely love change. I just enjoy it. I like restoration. I like transformation. I like seeing the potential in things and what things can be and to look at what they are and where we can grab them and move them or fix them to. I like transformation shows on TV, uh, like Fixer Upper or you get Property Brothers on or you know Tiny House, Big Living. I like it when people take motorcycles and they restore them back to their, uh, you know, their, their, their best version or even even better than they ever were. I like things where we restore. And I don't always always like all the drama that comes with a lot of those shows, uh, but I love watching the end transformation. So if you were to watch like Biggest Loser, which is such a horrible title, but it's so descriptive of what, I mean, they're losing weight. I absolutely love the show of watching people as they're wrestling through the wounds of being heavy. And as they're watching, you just watch them as they're growing and changing and getting help as they're trying to be a better version of themselves. And then I sometimes have even watched what not to wear because I think that's important. I just like seeing change. I like seeing people reach their potential because transformation to me, it is, it's just fascinating to watch and where we can grow to be who it is that God wants us to be. And one of my favorite stories is uh, still about Susan Boyle. And you might remember her, this woman of faith, who was in her 40s, who was on Britain's Got Talent. This was probably about 13, 14 years ago. And she admitted at the time she's never been kissed, that she lives alone in a village in England with her cat. But finally, she had this courage inside of her to finally step out. She got out of her shell, and she just uh, sang her heart out, and she blew the audience and the judges completely away where she sang, I Dream the Dream, which is from the production of Les Miserables, which is one of my favorite productions also. It was this YouTube sensation. She took the world by storm. She ended up coming out with a CD. And the year that her CD came out was the biggest selling CD of the year other than Taylor Swift, which, I mean, at this point, no one could ever beat that, which is, but she ran second place for that. And it started, I just, I just keep thinking, have you ever felt like, have you ever felt like you were made for something more, something much more, but you're stuck in a village alone with your little cat? Or where you felt like, you know what, you're, you're made for the open road, but you just, you're so rusty and you're stuck in this broken down garage somewhere. Because the good news is God loves change. God absolutely loves transformation. He likes to see people who are growing to reach their full potential. He loves to do something heavenly inside every single one of us, and he wants to restore you. He wants to restore me. He wants to change us but he has no desire to ever exchange us. And it's never too late to reach your full potential, and it's never too late to be the best version of yourself. It's never too late to be free. It's never too late to be the me that God wants me to be. God's will for your life, it's not about so much where you go or the things that you do. It's about who you are and who you are becoming. It is about becoming, and it's, it's from the inside out, to become God's best version of you. That is God's will, first will for your life, right there. And sometimes we can get stressed out about life, where am I supposed to do this, or do I do that? Well, is it him? Is it her? Is it this school? Is it that school? Do I take this job? Is it that job? Is it this direction? Is it that direction? And, and, and I think God does care about decisions that we make. I think he does. But I think God even cares more about who it is that we're becoming, where he says, my primary will is not about what you do or where you go, as it is who it is that you are becoming. And how is it that we are growing deeper in relationship with each other? I think God would much rather be a sculptor in our lives than a traffic cop. And he would much rather put us on a pottery wheel and kind of shape us and put his hands on us into something incredible instead of being kind of the guy at the intersection of our lives just pointing, well, you go this way or go that way. I think God would rather be this creative watercolor artist who 
just brings life and vibrancy than the Google search engine who just gives the answer when we type it in. He wants to put our hands, his hands on our lives, and he wants to mold us into the best version of us. Most artists are not really concerned about where it is they're going to put their art when they've created it. When they are making the art, they're not thinking where, you know, how great I'm going to be. Most oftentimes they're like, you know what, I don't care if it's in a museum, if it's in a doctor's office, if it's in a lobby somewhere, maybe Bed Bath & Beyond. The whole point is the reason I'm an artist is because I can't stop creating because I get so excited about working and putting my hands and seeing a vision and, and, and laying it out, coming up with the, the design and the color and the texture, and I just get excited actually making the piece of artwork. And, and then when I'm done with it, to look at it and go, that is exactly what I was wanting. In fact, it's even better than I'd hoped, and it does something emotional inside of me, and I get excited about it. God says, my will for you is not where you are going or what you are doing. It's about who you are. Let me help do that. Let me shape who you're going to become. Let me put my hands on you and mold you to be the you that you were meant to be. And the only way that can ever happen, the only way that we can experience even that deep soul satisfaction, the only way that we can live the life where you know that you're becoming God's best version of you is when you start to jump into the flow of the Spirit of God and you start to go upstream with your life, as we talked about last week, where you start to surrender to God. You just surrender your life, and, and, and it's to this involuntary and glad acknowledgement, you know what, there is a God, and that's not me. And, and I start to surrender into the flow, God, where do you want to guide me? Where do you want to lead me? And I'm going to follow you. And when we're in that flow, God, God starts to do some really cool things inside of us, and he starts to develop these qualities in us like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and, and, and patience. And, and I know that all of those things, I know that I need a whole lot more of. There was a woman who was in a grocery store and she saw this dad and he was pushing his cart and he had his, his boy right in the, the front. He was pushing the cart and he's just whispering. Uh, he's like, just be patient, Billy. You can do this. Just, you can make it. Just be patient. We're going to get through this. You can do this, Billy. You can do this. And this woman was just so impressed with him. So she walks up to the guy and said, oh, you're just talking so nice to your son. I just wanted to say how impressed I am. You're doing such a good job. And, and he's like, actually... <laughs> This is David. My name's Billy. Um, I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> I don't know if you need more patience in your life, where, where we need more peace and we need more joy and we want to feel more alive. And I want to be God's best version of myself, where maybe I could just throw the tarp off of that dusty old motorcycle so that I can be restored, so I can hit the open road so that I can be the best person that I can be, so that I can connect to God better, so I can hear the voice of God more. Because I want to hear the voice of God. I want to know God, and that I can be the best version of myself that He wants me to be. But for any of that to happen, for for many of us, something significant has to change. Something has to change, and the real change in you and me, becoming the me that we were meant to be, it's going to lie between my ears. That is oftentimes the greatest problem. Jesus told us all that we have an enemy, and he calls him a thief or the father of lies, and he he wants to keep us locked up in that musty old garage with that tarp of shame and guilt and inadequacy, and he wants to prevent us from becoming God's best version of ourselves. So he starts to target our mind that's the first place, because he knows there is nothing more powerful. And, and, and if he can get us to believe the lies, he knows that he can totally wreck our lives and, and derail us, or at least keep us stuck. And if he can start to influence your thinking, it will then shape your behavior. Because the, the way we live is always, it's always a reflection of the way that we think. Proverbs 23 says, the way that a person thinks in his heart, so they are. And what makes us the way that we are is the way that we think. The battlefield, it's not our behaviors. It's not the things that we're doing. The battlefield is our mind because true change in a person in in the life of us is going to start when we start to change our minds. If I want to be a better version of myself, 
It's not going to start with positive thinking. It's not going to start with self-help. When I surrender my life to the power of Jesus, I give up on self-help because to believe that I could actually change simply by having better thoughts and you know, sheer willpower without allowing God to get involved in the process, that is going to be an exercise in futility and frustration. But people who start to live lives who are going to be living and continue to live great lives are people who are consistently thinking great thoughts, Romans 12 too. And by the way, if you don't get the bulletin, if you didn't have the bulletin, it's, we don't have a handout. It's just the app where you take your phone up and you, we've got several of the QR codes. That has the bulletin. It has all the scripture and the notes if you needed it. Just a little side note. And it's also got our announcements on there should you need to remember those. Romans 12, 2. Let God transform you into the new person by changing the way you think. And as I read this, there's a part for me and there's a part for God to do. Only God has the ability for transformation. I let God transform me. And the Greek word for change is metamorpho. And we use that when we want to talk about a caterpillar that's going to change into the kind of high-flying butterfly. His job is to cooperate with a process. He has to surrender to the process of metamorphosis. And that is God's part. My part Your part is simply to renew our minds to a whole new way of thinking. Then how do we do that? One of the simple handles that helps me to renew my thoughts is simply feed and focus, right there. I think that if we can get that down, it's going to go a long way to renewing our minds so that God can transform me and God can transform us from the inside out. When you feed your mind what you feed your mind is going to determine the direction that you're heading so that you will or won't reach your full potential. So NASCAR drivers, they're careful with what kind of high-performance fuel they're going to put in the engines of their cars. And when you get a pilot, they're going to be very selective about fuel they put in their jets. Olympic athletes are going to be very disciplined about the type of fuel they put in their bodies. And choosy moms choose Jeff. But many of us, many of us forget the principle when it comes to our minds. We don't, we don't apply that. Somehow, oftentimes, it escapes us. We, we will feed our minds a whole lot of junk food, and, and I know that when I have a steady diet of junk food in my mind, it keeps me from being the best version of me that God wants me to be. It's just garbage in, garbage out. And if you find yourself feeding your mind pornographic images, it starts to do something to you. It does something to the way that you view other people. It does something to the way that you start to view relationships. And if you're someone who's always looking through magazines or looking at celebrities and the lifestyle of other people, looking at their perfect bodies and how they live, whether the rich and famous or other, you know, the, the movie stars, it starts to mess with your mind. It messes with your contentment. And it starts to make you insecure about your own, being in your own skin going, I don't measure up. I don't look like them. I'm not good enough. I'm not of value. I'm not of worth. And it starts to skew your perspective on what's important about stuff and image. And if you're feeding your mind kind of a steady diet of fantasies of romance novels, it starts to raise your expectations of what a relationship is supposed to be like. And you will start to head into dangerous levels where it's going to skew how you have a marriage or dating And whether it's movies or music or conversations or jokes, even people that are watching political opinion shows, we have to be careful what it is. I'm not saying that we can't have that. I'm saying we need to be aware of it and be careful what it is that we're feeding our minds because our minds are going to be shaped by the things that we feed it. And since we are what we think, it's really important for us to all take time to evaluate what it is that we're actually feeding our minds, where we slow down and start to ask questions like this. God, what are some of the unhealthy things that I've been putting into my mind? Because I think I do really want to change. What is it that I'm putting in? Can you help me to discern that and figure that out? David asked God in Psalm 139, he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Put me to the test and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way where you come to God and you ask, say, what direction are those thoughts leading me? 
honestly, God, um, are, are they leading me towards life? Are they leading me towards the best version of me? Are they leading me in another direction? And God, what are some of the, the unhealthy mental thoughts that I'm having? In the, what do I need to develop? What, would, uh, what could I do a better job in? And do I seem to gravitate towards selfishness? Do I gravitate towards defensiveness? Am I just irritable? And what's causing that? Do I have angry thoughts or anxious thoughts? Am I stubborn? Am I full of envy? Am I judgmental? God, I need you to help me start to have better thoughts. How do we start moving in a different direction? Can you show me the bad stuff that I've been feeding my mind and show me the good stuff that I need to be feeding my mind? Another passage in the Bible that has really helped shape my thinking is Philippians 4.8. Actually, read this with me, if you would. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I love it. Whatever. Whatever it is, we are free to think about Whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, and I like that because there are a lot of things that we could be feeding our minds with that are good things. There are so many things that fit into this. You could sit down and listen to a great piece of music that just fills your soul, and it starts to fill your mind and your heart with all kinds of good thoughts and good emotions. Or maybe it's a sunset, whatever it is that you just love to watch. Or maybe you're just like, I just want to hold a newborn baby where it just fills my mind with truth and goodness and God's creation and humility and humanity. Or maybe you're reading a good novel or watching a great movie and it moves you and it inspires you. Lewis Smedes said, God is so great that he doesn't need to be our only joy. Before you start reacting, let me, we're going to go somewhere with this. There is an earthly joy, a joy of the outer as well as the inner self, the joy of dancing as well as kneeling, the joy of playing as well as praying. And he's saying, and he's trying to say, is that untarnished by sin, desire is good, it's healthy. It's godlike because God created desire and he created beauty for us to appreciate. God has created things for us to enjoy because they reflect his glory. He created things because it's all designed as we move towards them to lead us to God. James 1, 17 says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. So whatever is true, whatever is noble, allow God to speak to you and show you the things that fall into those categories. Let God show you how he is unique and how he uniquely wired you so that he could speak to you. And it's going to be different how he speaks to all of us. And ask God, what is it that I'm feeding my mind so that I can flourish? So I could tell you, you should only be reading the Bible. And you'd be like, well, that's what a pastor's supposed to say. Only focus on God. But the reality is, I, I love many mornings, I'll turn on a piece of classical music. And I'm like, God, thank you for the, how you gave the gift of this music. And it leads me into the presence of God. And there are, uh, great artwork can do that. And a great conversation where we're laughing and crying I had a friend in my office on Friday and he was telling me these stupid stories that had me in tears and and ultimately all of it led me all straight to Jesus because it all had to do with God even though we weren't talking about God. We weren't vulgar, we weren't going down bad roads but at the end I was like, praise you, thank you God for just friendship where our souls connect and our hearts are growing and God how you're in that. And how we can also talk and lead each other to Jesus also. What is it that I'm feeding my mind so that it can grow and flourish? And I guarantee you, God's going to show you all kinds of things if you start to ask. And God will point you to all types of things where you start to filter them through your mind. What actually, to tell you things that are actually true. What actually is pure and lovely. 
And I know from experience that God will always point you to the source of ultimate truth, the truth about himself, the truth about you, the truth about his word, the truth about your life, and the truth is going to be found in the Bible. It is in this book. And I know from experience that is how God does it, God's word. And one of the things I can tell you about my own life is that when I take time to soak in this and take time to listen and read it, new thoughts start to come into my heart and into my mind and it feeds my mind in a way that nothing else can feed it and it renews my mind in ways that nothing else can renew my mind. When I grew up, I, I, I was always taught that you had to read a certain amount of chapters every day. Every day, before you do anything, you've got to read a certain amount of chapters and that's kind of your quiet time. And I, So I devote myself and, and I always wondered, so God, what is the minimum amount that I can read and get away with a quiet time and not have you mad at me or disappointed in me? Because I want to do it, kind of, I should do it. I just don't want you disappointed. I don't want you mad. It's not a, I don't even know that I want to read it, but I just don't want you mad at me. But that was the wrong question. God is not mad at us whether we read the Bible or not, or how much we do or don't read the Bible, no matter how much we read or don't read. He's not going to love you more if you read more. He's not going to love you less if you don't read more. He loves me for exactly who I am right now, right here. The better question would be is, what is it that I could be feeding my mind with so that I can grow to love God more and to flourish more so that I can enjoy God and love life more? Reading the Bible is not extra credit for God. It's not so you can get a 95% or higher on the entrance exam. It's not so that you can gain more knowledge. It's so that you can jump into the flow of the Spirit of God and what God's wanting to do in your heart and in your life and in your family and in our community and in this church so that you can plant yourself by the living stream of life and let God move in you. And I love how the psalmist writes it in chapter 1. He says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yield its fruit in seasons. And its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. And the job of the tree is not to produce fruit. The job of the tree is to plant itself by the river and to stay nourished. And that's why Paul says in Colossians 2, 7, he says, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the light that you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. One of the ways that I've learned to let my roots grow down and to connect deeply into him is to meditate on God's truth. And when I use the word meditate, that can freak some people out when I use meditation. I was taught that meditation was bad. And I'm not talking when I say meditation about burning incense and you know humming to yourself. But if you're a person who knows how to worry about things, do we have anyone that's good at worrying? Good. If you can worry, you can meditate. You can do this. Because that is all meditation is. Meditation is turning a thought over and over and over in your mind. And if you do that, your brain starts to get rewired and your mind is getting fed with some much needed truth. So let's start exchanging the things I worry about maybe with some truth. So maybe I would read a passage in the Bible that, that says, like Psalm 33, 5, the earth is full of God's unfailing love. And I read that, and I'm opening that up, and I'm like, okay, unfailing love, unfailing love. Okay, where do I get this unfailing love? Uh, I, don't, I don't know anyone that has unfailing love, but God, you have unfailing love. You seem to be talking about that. God, you love me, and you love me with an unfailing love. Nothing can separate me from that. Okay, so your love, it is high and wide and deep and long and, and it's unfailing. And I'm just, I just start to let my brain roll that around and I'm starting to meditate on that. And I start to turn that thought over and over and truth begins to renew my mind to what it is that I'm thinking about. And then I, I might read a passage like 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And I start to think, oh, I know I worry way too much. I know I do. I worry. And, and I need to give this to God, because God, you're bigger than this. 
there's this problem going over in this part of the world, and, and, and God, I'm worried, and I'm scared, and I see the news is trying to make me scared. Uh, and, and I don't, I, but God, I, I just trust that you can handle this. I can't do anything about it. I have no ability to solve this. I have no ability to do anything. I'm in Kathlamet. God, you're bigger than me. I can't control it. And, and if I was to try, I'm pretty sure I'd make it worse. So I'm going to cast my worry on you, God, and I give it to you. So God, take it. Please take it. Please take it. I trust you. I'm going to let go of it. Give me your peace. God, just fill me. Uh, I give you my anxiety. Give, you give me peace. I give it to you. Give me, and I just start to roll it around my brain, and I just over and over and over say these kinds of things to myself throughout the day. It's even a, it's a form of prayer, and this is a big deal because life is hard, and when when it when it gets hard, the enemy starts to whisper. He's like, "See, see, God doesn't love you because because this pain is coming at you." Just, just look at your whole life because it's all falling apart. You should worry. You can do better. If you don't step up and try and take control, who is? You should be worried. Be anxious because God doesn't really care about you or he would have already solved this. But when you've been feeding your mind truth, you start to able, you're better able to stay in the flow and see the lies for what they are, which are lies. Paul writes in Colossians 3, he says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. There are different ways that all of us are going to let the words and messages of God come inside of us. Some of you journal some of you, when you're reading the Bible, you're underlining it and you're, you're marking special verses that speak to you. And, and sometimes when a, a really a good verse, you're like, man, that's a good verse. If you don't already, write it down. Put it on an index card. Stick it on the mirror uh, you know, in your bathroom. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it someplace that you can see it. Put it you know, on your calendar or on a screensaver so that it scrolls across your screen all day when it you know, goes to sleep and suddenly you got this verse there. and you know, Then you have to make it so you have to log on before you can make it go away. And then you're like reading the verses. You're logging on. Or, or maybe you're more of an auditory learner where you just need to listen to a podcast or a Bible on CD or on an app on your phone or where you just start to let the words wash over you. And some of you, you need to let worship music where you're just, you're listening to this music that is, that comes out of the Bible and it's just kind of feeding your mind and your heart and you just let it wash over you. Or maybe you're more like me where you're a visual learner and you need to make something that can remind you of truth. So if you were to go into my office or even in this room, half the art in here is mine, uh, but they're all things in one way or another I had someone tell me the other day, they're like, Kenny, your art, it makes no sense. It's just leading us towards humanism and other stuff. I'm like, every single piece of artwork in some way or another has led me to a truth about God, and that's why every single one of them are created. So maybe we need to have a conversation about what the art means because you look at it and see a moose. I'm like, well, it's not about a moose. It's about something else. And I start to tell them. So this is as I was wrestling with God. This is where we landed. And if you were to go into my office, you would see the office filled with scripture and objects of art and books and all kinds and knickknacks that all of them are designed to tell me truth about who God is so that I can remember the who God and what God has done for me and what it is that God, who God really is and why I love him and why I trust him. And then when I'm in my office, you might go in there and go, whoa, I feel very overwhelmed. Too much sensory information. But I walk into my room and I sit there and I let it feed my mind and I let it feed my heart. Sometimes it's helpful for me to be able to get something out of reading the Bible. So this is where I relax, reflect, and respond. Just doing those three things. First of all, I relax when I read the Bible. I relax and I get in a comfortable position, and then I, I relax in the character of God. I don't go in going, all right, God, I'm coming at you. Or, you know, you're going you're gonna to come at me. I just go, God, I just want to read this, and I want to enjoy you. Can we connect some way? Open this up to me. And I start to relax in the truth about God and his grace. And then I reflect. I go, okay, God, as I read this, what are you saying to me right now? 
What are you trying to tell me in my season of life right now? What does that say to me in my relational world? And on Thursday, Wednesday mornings at 7.30, Steve Carson, we have a men's Bible study for any man. And this is all we do. We sit down, about 10 or so of us men, and we're having a Bible study. And you're like, well, I don't know how to study the Bible. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answers. We don't either. We get there. We read a passage in the Bible, and we start to just relax and we reflect, God, what are you saying? As I read this, this is what I'm getting. This is what I'm noticing. You, what do you guys see? How do I help? What do I do with this? What am I going to do? What, you know, what's it saying in my relational world? How does this say to us as a church? What does this say? And we start to then talk about it. And, and none of us have the authoritative, authoritative stamp. This is the answer, and we have to all do this. It's This is how we are all growing, and we do it together. And then I'll respond. Okay, God, what do I need to do with this as I'm reading this information? I'm going to get out of my seat. I'm going to go obey it, and I'm going to do what it is that I just read. Eugene Peterson, this awesome author, he says, Christians don't simply learn or study or use Scripture. We assimilate it. We take it into our lives in such a way that it gets metabolized into acts of love, cups of cold water, missions into all the world, healing and evangelism and justice in Jesus' name. Hands raised in adoration of the Father, feet washing in company with the Son. So if you have never read this book, it's uh, by Eugene Peterson. It's called Eat This Book. Such a great title. Eat This Book. Uh, I read this probably 10, 12 years ago, and I was really struggling reading the Bible. I'm like, I'm a pastor, and I'm supposed to read the Bible a lot more than I was. I was like, God... Give me a desire for eating the book, for eating the Bible and consuming it. And then I read this book. I'm like, well, I'm not ready to read the Bible, but I'll read a guy who tells me about reading the Bible. And it was awesome. And it really kind of kick-started me back into having a hunger for reading the Bible. So if you're looking for another book, I did not buy 35 copies of that one. Eugene Peterson, fantastic book. But when I started to practice the things that I was learning not just reading about encouraging others, but I actually started to encourage others. When, when, when I started to sit down and write notes to other people, well, I didn't just listen to talks about serving people, but when I actually went out and started to serve people, when I actually started to do the dishes or run the vacuum at my house without my wife expecting it or asking me to do it, I began to change when I didn't just read a verse that says you should go serve the poor, but I started to respond to the cries of the poor that God led me to, when I started to do the dishes, run the vacuum, serve my wife, serve my family and the church and the community without waiting for people to ask, that's when God started to move inside of me. I find that when I'm actually starting to do the things that God says, then my mind starts to change from what I ought to do to the things that I want to do. And I start to become the better version of me that God wants me to be. And there's many great, many great resources out there. There's great books that we could read, but I am convinced, again, just this book right here, the greatest book that you could ever spend time reading. This is the single most indispensable tool that you could ever have at your disposal. And the thing is, is I'm always fine. I, I just started reading a new translation, and I've been using it actually in the scripture for the last, I don't know, month. It's the New Living Translation. For whatever reason, that translation, I'm like, oh man, just things are lighting up in my brain in a new way. Find a translation that does that. If you're like, well, I've been reading King James Version for 500 years, and it's still the only way I can do it. But if it's exciting, then keep reading the King James. Me, the King James is dusty and dry like my grandma's turkey on Thanksgiving. It's just like, ha, ah, you cough it up. It's just powder. And uh, find it something, find a translation of the Bible. And it's like eating a juicy pear that just kind of runs down your face. I love it. So find something that is going to do it because it is the most indispensable tool that we have. And in it, we start to learn, how do I be a better friend? How do I be a, a better marriage partner? How do I be a better date? How do I be a better parent? How do I manage my money better? How do I manage uh, my anger better? How do I resolve conflict? How do I get right with God through Jesus Christ? And how do I learn to stay in the flow because it can teach me right from wrong and as we start to renew our minds and feed our minds with God's word, God is going to start to change us from the inside out. Feed 
and focus. What we choose to focus on has our attention. That's just the truth. Whatever has your attention is what you're going to do. Do we have any golfers in the room? No one. No one golfs. Well, this one's going to go right by you then. I don't know. But when you're up on the tee, one of the worst things you can do before you tee off is to say, oh, there's a, there's a water trap on the right. There's a water trap on the right. There's a water trap on the right. Don't want to hit it there. There's a water trap on the right. What do you think is going to happen when you hit that ball? Water trap on the right. Exactly. What has your attention is, has you. When you have uh, taking your motorcycle license test and you have to go through the cones and, and you're trying, they tell you, don't focus on the cones. Focus where you need to go because when we, where we focus, that is where we're going to go. Where we say, okay, I, 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 when we start to go, I, I, I can't think about that. I can't think about that. I shouldn't think about that. I can't, th- I can't think about that. I can't think about that. When you're telling yourself what you can't think about, that is exactly all you're still thinking about. The key is not to resist. The key is to replace. Change your focus. Our minds have the ability to change our focus. We choose what it is we set our attention on. Well, I really need to stop this habit. I got to stop this habit. I need to stop this habit. I need to stop doing that. I need to stop, stop, stop telling yourself. Say, how do I choose this? I choose this. I want this. I go after that. Choose what it is you set your attention on. John Milton in his epic poem, Paradise Lost, said the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. In your mind, you choose to move towards gratitude. You choose to move towards a sense of entitlement. You can set your mind on joy and contentment or you can set it on dissatisfaction and envy. We have the ability to set our mind. God is the one who has the ability to set and metamorphosis us. Have any of you ever read The Dog's Diary and Cat's Diary? All right, I'll read it for you. So here's The Dog's Diary. 8 a.m., dog food, my favorite thing. 9.30 a.m., a car ride, my favorite thing. 9.40, a walk in the park, my favorite thing. 10.30 in the morning, get rubbed and petted, oh, my favorite thing. 12 o'clock, lunch, my favorite thing. One in the afternoon, I played in the yard. That's my favorite thing. Three o'clock, I wagged my tail. Favorite thing. 5 p.m., milk bones. Yes, my favorite thing. 7 p.m., I got to play ball. That's my favorite thing. 8 p.m., watch TV with my people. My favorite thing. 11 p.m., I get to sleep on the bed. My favorite thing. And then you have the cat diary. Day 983 of my captivity. My captors continue to taunt me with bizarre little dangling objects, and the only thing that keeps me going is my dream of escape. (laughs) And that is the way it is. You can set your mind. We have that ability. You can change your focus. You really can. You can set your mind. That's why Paul wrote into the Colossians chapter 3. He said, Since then you have been raised with Christ, Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And it's been my experience that when you and I, when we set our minds on ourselves, when we focus on earthly things, on worldly stuff, the inevitable result is I'm going to be filled with worry, anxiety, and greed, and competition, and security, fear, discouragement. I just take myself out. But when I start to set my mind on things above, on what it is that God is doing, and I start to fix my thoughts onto His thoughts, no matter how tough life gets, and when, when, when things aren't going well, and sometimes pain in our life starts to want to encroach and get in the middle of our focus, and if I have God's focus and I start to focus on Him and I begin, I begin to start to get a sense of hope and confidence and humility and love and laughter and security and this inexplainable peace right in the middle of things no matter how hard they are. Here's a verse for your screensaver. Isaiah 26.3 You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And it all comes down to focus. 
And every day you say, God, I I give you my life today. Today I surrender my life to you again. And I just want to stay in the flow. Help me to stay focused on your presence in my life. And as you just do that all day long, God, I want my thoughts to be fixed on you. Do you realize what a big deal this is? This is huge. Do you get it? I mean, this is, this is a game changer. It has the potential. Because so many of us have spent so many years of our life, life fixed on things that are, have nothing to do with God. And that's just the truth. And now the good news is that many of us finally realize the emptiness of that kind of life. And, and when we wake up, when we come to our senses, and we, we come home to God, when we surrender our life to God and we ask Jesus to be our personal savior and the leader of our life and we're forgiven and we kind of our past is our past that doesn't have to hold on to us anymore and our future is going to be secured because he get, died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and our identity we are now a treasured child of God we are a new creation the old is gone and the new has come but every one of us and I don't know if you've ever realized this if you've ever discovered that there is not a delete button in your brain where I still have to wrestle with some of the old thoughts of things that I've done in my life. Ah, And I'm like, why is that? And sometimes it's because that was the focus for so long in my life. And and it set a pattern of what it is I'm going to think on. And some of those old pictures are engraved in my brain of things that I've done. And you have those old memories of your past, those old ways of relating to people, old ways of reacting to people, old patterns of thinking, and they don't automatically just go. And that's why the Bible says, renew your minds, put a new focus on the old, where the old focus has been, because the old focus has been set for a really long time. I've got a friend named Mike who had all kinds of relationships. He made a lot of bad decisions in his life. And then he got right with God, and he kind of cleaned up his life. God really started to transform him. I got to baptize the guy. That was one of the highlights for me. And he's just a new, he was a new guy. And he was doing great for a while until his girlfriend broke up with him, and he just didn't know how to handle it. So when you don't know how to handle something, what many of us do is we go back to how I used to handle things. Because I just don't know what else to do. And, and went back to some of the old patterns of coping. So he kind of relapsed and he called me and was like, hey, can we talk? And I'm like, yeah, of course we can. And, and I remember the, the conversation where he said, I just lost my focus. I just feel crummy because that's not who I am anymore. That's not who I want to be. That's not, that's not me. And, and he just felt like telling me that that behavior was not matching where his heart was and that w- with the kind of new person that he was. And I just got so excited. I'm like, Mike, you are right. You're, you're no longer Mike the alcoholic. You are Mike the much-loved child of God. And God's power is going to break that addiction in you one day at a time. And that is the truth. And that has to be your focus because, Mike... If you don't focus on the truth, you're going to start to believe that you are the same person that never changed. And if you think that you're the same person, you're going to start to live like that old person, even though that's not who you are anymore. I got another friend. He's down in California. He has an almond farm. And I was out driving his beat-up old Willie's Jeep one day. It had these uh, pennies welded all over. I'm like, what are those? He's like, well, I got it from World War II, and it had all these bullet holes, so I welded these pennies all over. I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. But, But you could drive that Jeep, and you didn't even have to look where you're driving. You didn't have to put your hands on the wheel because he had these ruts in these roads. You could go from one end of his orchard to the other without even putting your hands on the wheel because the ruts were so deep. That tire had driven, those tires had driven that for so long that if you wanted to change direction, you had to jerk that wheel because you had to want to get out of that rut. And I told Mike, you need new ruts in your life. You need new paths and patterns of thinking. You need a brand new focus so that you can stay focused on the flow of the Spirit of God and what God is doing in you and focus on that. And God will help you to even have new thoughts. I want to go back to the Philippians passage. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence... And if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And I do this with my thoughts all day long. 
This is how I do it. I, I, I just take a thought and I drop it through the filter of his word. God, is that a good thought? Yeah, that's a good thought. Okay, good, let's keep it. I wasn't sure. So God, I, these are some of the thinking. I just, I just talk to God all day. I'm just kind of, it's just, I don't, have a, I don't have a filter. So I'm like, God, you help me filter. And all day long, I'm just praying and talking to God and just having a conversation. Do I, should I do this? What do I do about that person? God, I just, I need help. I, what do I, what do I do? What do I, how do, how do I, how do I, what do I? And I just start to stay in the flow all day. God, I'm about to go to this meeting and, and I'm having some of these thoughts. Can you help me with some of these thoughts? God, and, and God, I'm looking at this cover of the Sports Illustrated issue, and, and I mean, God, it says, whatever is lovely, and I'm, I'm looking, at it, and God's like, well, that may not be the case. We're, that's why we run it through the filter, Kenny, is because it's true she's lovely, but that is not a noble thought, and, and, and if you keep feeding your mind on this kind of stuff, it's going to change how you relate to women, and it's going to change how you demean and devalue women. I'm like, okay, we can do this, God. I'll, I'll do it. Or, or God, what they're saying about my boss in the break room is absolutely true because he is a jerk. I can't stand the guy. And I, I just want to jump in and share my opinion. I've got a few stories and, and God just says, ah, oh, that might be true what they're saying. But, but it's not an excellent way to be an employee. This is, there's a better way to deal with conflict. And, in fact, what you're thinking, uh, it's not even praiseworthy because you're not even trying to help the situation. You're just wanting to vent and hurt. And all day long, God is helping me filter my thoughts, and it's a practical way for me to use God's word and to filter my thoughts. And in seconds, the Holy Spirit starts to help me to make a better decision. And like you, sometimes I don't want to listen to God. I, I do that too. I struggle. And I don't want to do what God is telling me to do. Well, God, I'm going to do this. I know what you want me to do, but I don't want to do it. And I'm going to do what I want anyhow. And oftentimes when I do that, the natural consequences come and I get in trouble. And I don't always like the consequences. And I wish I, wish I had just listened. God, I am sorry. I wish I had stayed in the flow. But God will speak to us all day long as we filter our thoughts through his word. I just kind of want to wrap it up as we read this next one out loud again. Romans 8, 5. Those who are dominated by their sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. When you and I have our minds set on God and what God wants, your mind starts to get renewed. God has a job, we have a job. But what it is we're feeding our mind on, if it's the right kind of stuff, God can actually then have the freedom to transform you so that you and I can be the, the me and the we that God wants us to be. So Father, just fill us this morning as we just start to process the things that we're seeing and thinking and doing as we start to come. God, renew our hearts, renew our minds. Give us the ability even to ask the hard questions so that we can continue to shed the things because so much of the struggle of our lives are actually things that we, we put there ourselves. And God, we want to love you better. God, I want you to use me more. And I know the only way that you're going to do that is if I start to let go of more. So God, continue to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill us, God. We ask that your presence just be strong among us. Can you stand, please? <clears throat> if you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lie And if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside Oh, there's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker If you need freedom or saving He's a prison shaker
We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. And we've all run to things we know just ain't right. There's a better life. Saying it's 
Are you past the point of weary? And is your burden weighing heavy? And is it all too much to carry? And let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause the shame's done all the stealing. Are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an Yeah. 